Okay then everybody, welcome back to the Symmetry Seminar. Um, this week we're very happy to have Eric Sharp. Uh, he's going to tell us about decomposition. All right, Take well, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking about something that, uh, as you can tell, I've been uh, fiddling around with for quite a while and have recently been revisiting in some more detail. Um, my goal today is to give a somewhat pedagogical talk. I'm going to begin with some you know, overview, some discussion of various applications and whatnot. And then after around five slides, I'll get into more concrete details. Um, if anyone has questions, please do uh, just stop and interrupt me. I'm probably not going to be so good at being able to keep up, keep up with the chat while I'm doing this. Um, and again, the, I was asked to give a pedagogical talk. So I, my, my goal is to try to uh, say something that, will, that, that people will understand. So my talk today concerns decomposition. Now, what is decomposition? Well, briefly, decomposition is the observation that some local quantum field theories are secretly equivalent to sums or disjoint unions of other local quantum field theories, which in this context have come to be known as universes. As such, it acts as a sort of counterexample to certain old lore linking locality and cluster decomposition. And that's the, the second is the reason for the name. When this happens, when one field theory can be written as a sum of others, we say that the field theory decomposes, and then that decomposition can be applied to give insight into its properties. Now, what does it mean? Let me start there. What does it actually mean concretely for one field theory to be a sum of others? What can we actually compute to check this? Well, first off, it means that the theory contains some projection operators, which project um, the states onto the constituent universes. So technically, this means the theory contains a set of topological operators, which I'll denote pi, that commute with everything and that will act as projectors. They are orthogonal to one another, any projector squares to itself, and they form a complete set. Um, since the operators are simultaneously diagonalizable, we can well, diagonalize the state space write all the states in the space as a sum of uh, you know, eigenspaces of uh, each of those projectors. And as a consequence, then, we can formally write correlation functions as a sum of correlation functions in each of the constituent universes. So here's the quick formal argument for that. I start with any correlation function in the original theory. I then insert the identity using uh, this completeness relation here. I then use the fact that these projectors square to themselves and that they are topological to essentially spread them out. I take this one projector, I turn it into several, and I'm multiplying each of those O's. And then the result looks like a sum over constituent universes of correlation functions computed in each universe, where the uh, uh, operators whose correlation functions are being computed are the projections of the original operators into that constituent universe. Um, the second you know, easy thing to compute, and it's the second part that I'm going to be focusing on more through this talk to give some insight and to check various statements, is the fact that partition functions decompose. So formally, if I think of the partition function as um, sum over states weighted by a Hamiltonian, the fact that the state space decomposes in this fashion means I can write the state space sum as a sum over universes, and then a sum over those exponentials within each universe, which gives rise to a sum of partition functions. Now, when does this happen? The answer is more often than I would have guessed before I got into this. So the first examples, which I'm going to be using as prototypes for a lot of things today, are going to be two-dimensional orbifolds or finite gauge theories. So the common thread is that an orbifold will decompose when a subgroup of the gauge group acts trivially. So for example, if a subgroup of the center of the orbifold group acts trivially, then the orbifold by gamma is a sum over orbifolds by effectively acting cosets, gamma mod k, with a sum over irreps. Um, details will vary in other cases. This is just one set of examples. We'll see more later. So other examples, gauge theories. A two-dimensional abelian gauge theory with non-minimal charges is the same as a sum of abelian gauge theories with minimal charges. Uh, more generally, a two-dimensional G gauge theory, where G might be non-abelian, but with center invariant matter, is a sum of G mod center theories with discrete theta angles and the same matter. 
So for example, an SU2 theory in two dimensions with center invariant matter is the sum of a pair of SO3 theories with the same matter, where the plus and minus label choices of discrete theta angles in those two SO3 gauge theories. And I'll come back to discrete theta angles uh, later. For a more extreme example, two-dimensional pure Yang-Mills, um, it turns out to be a sum of trivial field theories, essentially um, uh, invertible field theories, indexed by the irreducible representations of G. This was worked out relatively recently. So for example, pure SU2. On the one hand, I could think of a pure SU2 theory. I, I could take a pure SU2 theory and decompose it into a pair of SO3 theories like this, but the insight of these authors was that we can do something even more extreme and write a pure SU2 Yang-Mills theory in two dimensions as a disjoint union of essentially sigma models on points, modulo Euler counter terms. Um, for another example, so far I've talked about two dimensional gauge theories. Here's an example in four dimensions. If I take four dimensional Yang-Mills and restrict to instantons of degree divisible by K, the result is a union of ordinary four-dimensional Yang-Mills theories, but with different theta angles. So I have a uh, multiple different Yang-Mills theories in which the theta angles between each is rotated um, in such a way that the uh, sum of those theories cancels out instantons of the wrong degree. I'll, I'll come back to what that means in a few minutes. All right, some more examples. Um, topological field theories two-dimensional unitary topological field theories with semi-simple local operator algebras also decompose. This has been implicit in the literature for a while. Moore and Siegel had a paper on exactly this back in 06, and its relation to decomposition in the sense I'll be talking about was uh, at least made clear to me by um, uh, these authors. So for example, two-dimensional abelian BF theory at level K is a disjoint union of K invertible theories. The two-dimensional G mod G model at level K is a disjoint union of invertibles, as many as the number of integrable representations of the Katz-Moody algebra. Um, for another example, two-dimensional dykraff witten theory is a sum of invertibles, as many as the irreducible number of irreducible representations of the Orbifold group, which is, in fact, this is just a special case of the Orbifolds I'll talk about later. And then finally, I'm not going to say a lot about this last point, but for completeness, I wanted to mention it. Um, sigma models on gerbs. This is how I originally got into this. Gerbs are generalizations of spaces with metrics and spinners and all the structure you would expect to need to define a sigma model. They also have some confusing technical issues. Um, a sigma model on a gerb turns out to be the same as a disjoint union of ordinary sigma models on underlying spaces. Again, I, I'm not going to say a lot about that today, but it uh, it's very much in the back of my mind. Now, so far I presented what should seem like some very different examples in which some sort of decomposition is happening, in which one field theory is breaking up into a disjoint union. So what's the common thread? What do these examples all have in common? So the answer is that in D space-time dimensions, we believe a theory decomposes when it has a global D minus one form symmetry. So decomposition and higher form symmetries go you know, hand in hand. Now, let me also take a minute to distinguish decomposition from the closely related notion of spontaneous symmetry breaking. We have a few parallels, but also some important differences. Um, when I think about supersymmetry breaking and super selection sectors in particular, um, I think of uh, super selection sectors as being something that's only genuinely disjoint deep in the infrared or in infinite volume limits. The, my go-to example for super selection involves the magnetization on a bar magnet. If you just hand me a bar magnet, microscopically the spins are all aligned so that the bar magnet has some net magnetization pointing in one given direction. Now there's nothing in nature that says the bar magnet has to point and the magnetization has to point in that direction. It could in principle point in other directions. If I take that magnet and heat it up enough, the spins will randomize, and then if it cools back down, indeed, they may all align in a different direction. So the choices of uh, magnetization at low energies form, to my mind, a nice example of a super selection sector. Um, they're only genuinely disjoint deep in the infrared. Um, there's only one overall quantum field theory. By contrast, in a decomposition, um, the different universes are disjoint at all energy scales. The idea really is that you have multiple different quantum field theories in a decomposition. Now, 
if I've been doing Eric, my can job. Eric, can I ask a question? So, please do. Um, in the connection to the uh, D minus one form symmetries, is the idea that mm -hmm. these are exactly the symmetries where you have that are generated by topological local operators? Yes. And yes. You should, yes. You should think about each of those other kind of non-identity topological operators, like the identity of another another universe. Yes. Is that yes. Right? And then the projectors are built as linear combinations of those topological local operators. That's that's definitely part of the story. And we'll see okay. concrete examples of that later. But yeah, you're okay. you're definitely right on. Okay. All right. Um, um, tests of decomposition. Um, so first off, since I grew up doing string compactifications, the first test we did involved gauge linear sigma models. We went and computed mirrors and quantum cohomology rings. Um, back in 05, we did this for uh, using hori Vafa technology to understand mirrors to abelian GLSMs, and we can see decomposition very explicitly there. Recently, we were able to revisit these issues using notions of non-abelian mirrors. And again, we see decomposition explicitly in non-abelian mirrors as well. Orbifolds, I will be talking about extensively later. One sees the same structure in open strings and in K-theory. Um, you know, in the case of an orbifold or a gauge theory, if I have a gauge group that acts trivially on the bulk degrees of freedom, it might still act non-trivially on the boundary degrees of freedom. As a result, the boundary degrees of freedom essentially organize themselves into irreps of that trivially acting subgroup, um, and those correspond to the universes. Furthermore, uh, there's no way to build, write down an open string connecting boundaries in different universes. That's uh, essentially, uh, you can use gauge invariance to exclude that. This is also reflected in mathematical statements about K-theory of gerbs, but that's uh, another story. You can see this in supersymmetric gauge theories with localization. Um, it shows up in non-supersymmetric pure Yang mills, as I've briefly mentioned. Um, it was recently checked in statements about adjoint QCD2 uh, a couple of years ago now. It's been checked in lattice gauge theory. People have put these, uh, just uh, put this on a lattice and checked numerically that this works. And again, although I'll spend a, much of the talk talking about two-dimensional theories, this really is, uh, works in higher dimensions as well. And then before getting into the meat of the talk, let me just briefly mention the applications. For my mind, the original application was to make sense of sigma models on stacks. This resolves some otherwise confusing and uh, potentially fatal issues in making sense of those. Um, this made predictions for gromov witten theory back, you know, way back when. Uh, my favorite application is to non-perturbative constructions of geometries and gauge linear sigma models. It's now a, a standard trick in the GLSM community for uh, building geometries, um, um, but not just as the critical locus of a superpotential. It's been applied to well, elliptic genera and to check statements about IR limits of pure gauge theories in two dimensions. And it's also been applied to understand anomalies in orbifolds and to the Wang Wen Witten anomaly resolution mechanism, although I'm not really going to be talking about any of that today. Okay, so in D space-time dimensions, we believe a theory decomposes when it has a global D minus one form symmetry. Now today what I'm going to do is produce examples by gauging a trivially acting D minus two form symmetry that will generate um, a theory with a global D minus one form symmetry as a consequence. Now, this is equivalent to various different things. Um, one thing this is going to be equivalent to is a theory with restrictions on instantons, at least in, in typical sort of generic examples. Um, another thing this will be equivalent to is a sigma model on a gerb, and I think this will be the next to last time I'll mention the G word in this talk, but again, it's uh, very much in the back of my mind. Part of the idea is that a gerb is a fiber bundle whose fibers are groups of higher form symmetries. So if I have a sigma model, well, whenever I have a sigma model on a fiber bundle, that sigma model should have a global symmetry corresponding to translations along the fibers. So if I have a sensibly defined sigma model on a gerb, that sigma model should have a translation symmetry corresponding to, or a global symmetry corresponding to translations on the fibers, which in this context is a higher form symmetry. And then finally, as, as Matthew remarked earlier, this also ties into the algebra of topological local operators. And part of the fun is that decomposition will relate these pictures. The restriction on instantons we're going to see will emerge as a sort of multiverse interference effect between the different universes of the decomposition.
The form symmetry I just outlined arises as a translation symmetry along the fibers of the gerb when we think about uh, things in this language. And then finally, the relation to trivial group actions. The relation to gauging a trivially acting D minus two form symmetry emerges in this language because the higher form symmetry groups are uh, quotients of points by groups. And let me just briefly try to make sense of that. If I take, um, ordinarily, if I take a point and quotient by a group, I just get a point back again. But for the relevant notions of geometry, the math will keep track of automorphisms and it can distinguish a point from a point mod G. So this is one representation of um, a one form symmetry group BG, and that's the fiber of a gerb. Uh, since we've described that as a trivial group action, whenever you see a, a gauge theory with a trivially acting subgroup, a good intuition is that you've fibered this. All right, now let me start getting into the meat of things. Now that I've given some general overview of what decomposition is about. What I want to begin with is a study of decomposition in two-dimensional orbifolds. And then after that, which will take up the majority of the time I have today, I'll, I'll outline analogs in three-dimensional orbifolds and three-dimensional Chern-Simons. And then if time permits at the end, I'll talk about how decomposition can be applied to condensation defects and their fusion rules. So uh, let's build examples in two dimensions. The game I'll play is to gauge a non-effectively acting zero form uh, group to get a theory with a global one form symmetry. So specifically, somewhat specifically, let's consider an orbifold X mod gamma with some trivially acting subgroup. So what I wanna do here is just uh, describe in general terms how the story should work. Then I'm gonna work through a specific example of an orbifold of this form to really dial things in and check all the details. And then I'll go back to three dimensional cases and so forth. So let's consider an orbifold of the form X mod gamma, where gamma is a, a central extension of some finite group G by some abelian group K. And decomposition exists more generally, but this is a good starting point. So I'll associate the central extension with an element of degree two group cohomology, which I'll label omega. Now this orbifold has a global BK symmetry, and as such, it should decompose. So I'm going to outline in the next few slides one way to see how that decomposition works. The decomposition in this case will relate the, orbif the gamma orbifold to a disjoint union of G orbifolds with various values of discrete torsion, where the discrete torsion will be determined by the image of this extension class under an irrep of K. So I characterize these universes by irreps of K, for any given irrep, I can map the extension class to an element of degree two group cohomology valued in U1, which will define an element of discrete torsion, which will twist this orbifold. So what I wanna do next is outline one way to see why that works, and then I'll really wade into the details in a particular example. And then I'll use that as a prototype to walk through uh, examples in higher dimensions. So let's establish this in partition functions. And for simplicity, let me work on a partition function on a two torus. Now, universally, for any orbifold on a two torus, I can write the partition function in this form. So one over the or order of the orbifold group, a sum over commuting pairs of partitions functions I've labeled Z gamma one gamma two, where the idea is that a ZGH is a, um, in this case, is going to be a, um, um, a sigma model with branch cuts as it rises in path integral representations of orbifolds. Or put another way, it's a sigma model over maps from squares into X, where the two vertical sides are, the images of the two vertical sides are related to one another by G, and the images of the two horizontal sides are related to one another by H. And in order for that diagram to actually close up and give up a square, I need for G and H to commute with one another. Otherwise, when I go around the two edges in different orders, I'll get to different points. I need the commutivity condition in order for the square to actually close. Now, what I'm gonna do is count commuting pairs of elements in gamma. Basically, this is gonna boil down to some combinatorics exercise in computing this. So let me think about how that works. Gamma is described as an extension, a central extension of G by K which means that as a set, the elements of gamma are just 
pairs, an element of G and an element of K, but with a deformed multiplication. So I can think of any gamma in any little gamma inside gamma as a pair, G and K, where the multiplication is of this form. I just multiply the group elements G1 and G2 in the ordinary fashion, and then the product of the Ks is deformed by the image of this co-cycle omega. So then in that language, if I demand that gamma one and gamma two commute with one another, well, just looking at this product, the only way gamma one and gamma two can commute with one another is if G one and G two commute. And since K is abelian, commutivity of those two factors is automatic, but I also need this co-cycle to be symmetric. I need omega of G one, G two to be the same as omega of G two, G one. So those are the two uh, conditions. I've, I've translated commutivity of pairs in gamma to this pair of conditions on uh, elements of G. So just in passing, let me mention, this is a first example of a restriction on non-perturbative sectors. If I want to think about this gamma orbifold as being something like a G orbifold, then, well, to some extent we can. We do get uh, pairs of elements G, um, the elements of K are going to act trivially on X. Um, so this is sort of like a G orbifold. However, um, the only elements of G that are allowed are pairs such that this condition it holds. Now, if I go back to the computation of the partition function, on a two torus, that gamma orbifold partition function always universally has this form. So now what I'm going to do is uh, write this as, as a G orbifold. Um, I'm going, I get a factor of k squared because the elements of k act trivially. So I can just factor them out of the counting. They contribute an overall factor of k squared. And then I need to restrict to um, not just commuting pairs of elements of G, but commuting pairs of elements such that this condition holds. So formally, I'm going to insert a delta function inside that partition function. Now, to do that, let me give you an expression for that delta function. I can express this as a sum over irreps of k of well, basically the image of this ratio under rho. So if that ratio is different from one, this is going to amount to a sum over roots of unity, and that sum will vanish. If that ratio equals one, then uh, this, the sum by itself will just give me copies of one as many as irreps. Dividing by this will turn that into a one. So in particular now, if I take this expression for that delta function and insert it back into this expression for the partition function, what we quickly find is an expression of this form. Um, at least at the level of the two torus partition function, we can write the two torus partition function of the gamma orbifold as a sum of partition functions of G orbifolds, but with these phase factors. And these phase factors are precisely discrete torsions on each of the constituent uh, G orbifolds. So what I've done is to take this gamma orbifold partition function and turn it into a sum of G orbifold partition functions, but with sort of rotating values of discrete uh, torsion. So in particular, adding the different universes of the decomposition together is having the effect of projecting out some of the non-perturbative sectors. Specifically, non-perturbative sectors in which this ratio of co-cycles is different from one. So, so far, I've demonstrated that at least at the level of two torus partition functions, this gamma orbifold is the same as a disjoint union of G orbifolds with various values of discrete torsion. Now, the same thing can be done at any genus and for local operators, uh, there are all kinds of tests one can do. This is just sort of one prototypical computation to demonstrate uh, part of the idea behind what's going on in a decomposition. Now, to try to make this a little bit more clear, let me take the time to walk through the details a bit more in a particular example that is my go-to example for these things. Let's consider the example of a D4 orbifold. So by D4, I mean the eight element dihedral group, which has center Z mod two. So I'll take the Z2 center to act trivially on X. Because I'm gauging a, uh, an or because I'm gauging a group with a trivially acting Z2, this has a one form symmetry. Uh, namely a, a BZ2 one form symmetry. Furthermore, if I quotient D4 by Z2, I get Z2 cross Z2. D4 is a central extension of Z2 cross Z2 by Z2. It's essentially a finite Heisenberg group, I believe. 
Um, so this is going to be closely related to a Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. Now, from the story I just told you, I, decomposition predicts that, well, any gamma orbifold with a trivially acting center should be a sum of G orbifolds with different values of discrete torsion, which in this case means the D4 orbifold should be a sum of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds with and without discrete torsion. So let me check that explicitly. Let me begin by actually going back and looking at operators. Let me construct the projection operator associated with each of the two universes. So to that end, let me let Z hat denote the dimension zero twist field associated with that trivially acting Z2. It's for essentially trivial reasons, Z hat squares to the identity. And using that, it's easy to build projection operators. I just take half of one plus or minus Z hat. In fact, there's a general formula you can write down that works in other orbifolds. Um, mathematically, it's a consequence of Wedderburn's theorem as applied to centers of group algebras. Never mind that level of detail. In this case, it's sort of obvious. I've got a Z hat that squares to one. Well, here's the obvious way I can build a projection operator. And then it's easy to check that this has all the right properties. Uh, they square to themselves. They are orthogonal. If I multiply the two different ones together, I get zero. And their sum is the identity operator. So in passing, note that the untwisted sector lies in both of the universes of the decomposition. So the, each universe is a linear combination of twisted and untwisted sectors. It's not that you know, one universe is untwisted, another universe is the twisted sector. Rather, both universes involve both the untwisted and twisted sectors. It's some you know, skew symmetric combination, if you will. So now let me uh, quickly walk through partition functions. The computation is basically the same as what I've already discussed, but it's uh, fun to do it in this example. So again, uh, the two torus partition function has this universal form where each ZGH is a sum over twisted sectors of this like so. And by combinatorics, we'll be able to argue that the partition function of the D4 orbifold is a sum of partition functions of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds. And the detail goes, details go like this. Um, let me uh, enumerate the elements of D4 like so. I'll let Z gen generate the center. The other elements are generated by A and B. So there's an element AZ, an element BZ, an element AB, and then BA is the ABZ. So since Z acts trivially, each of these twisted sectors is symmetric under multiplication by that trivially acting central Z. So the GH sector makes the same contrib contribution as the GZH sector, as the GH0 sec as GHC sector, and the GZHC sector. Furthermore, each of these sectors I can think of as a uh, essentially a D4 bundle. And the way I can get from this D4 bundle to this D4 bundle is by tensoring in a Z2 bundle like so. So we can see that not only is there a symmetry amongst these sectors, but that symmetry is encoded in a tensor product with um, a Z2 bundle. So this is how I tend to think about the, the BZ2 one form symmetry in this context. For me, the BZ2 one form symmetry, well here, or a, a BG symmetry more generally, is a symmetry generated by, well, in two dimensions, tensoring in your gauge bundle, tensoring a G bundle into your gauge bundle. Um, it's a symmetry amongst the non-perturbative sectors that's generated by an action not of elements of groups, but of bundles of groups. And here I'm getting uh, moving from one non-perturbative sector to another non-perturbative sector by tensoring in a principal Z2 bundle into a D4 bundle. So each D4 sector that appears is the same as a Z2 cross Z2 sector. Um, and when I get one, I get that with multiplicity four, except for these sectors, which don't appear at all. The problem is the reason these sectors don't appear is that Okay, so you got stuck. Eric? That I cannot lift these group elements. They can Eric, you Sorry. Got, I Zucker, think you, you had a question? No, I, I think you, your internet got stuck, so we oh, didn't let me, the last minute. Let me turn off my video then. That should help. Hang on a it second. It was okay so far. It was just like the last couple of minutes, like one minute. Okay, uh, let me, um, I think the last slide, 
Yeah, that's just that. You probably heard all about that. We got that. all this, and then okay. I think when you change the next slide, it's just stop. Got it. Okay, let me just start over here. Um, right, so I'm going to list the elements of D4 like this. Z generates the center, A and B generate the rest. So the other elements are just products. There's an AZ, a BZ, an AB, and then if I multiply A and B in the opposite order, I don't quite get AB back again, but something differing by an element of Z, or differing by Z. Um, each D4 sector that appears is the same as a D4 mod Z2 sector, since the Z2 acts trivially. Since I can multiply a Z2 into either the G or the H, that means each Z2 cross Z2 sector that appears will appear with multiplicity four, because you know, whenever one of these appears, I can multiply in a Z on either side to get another one. However, some Z2 cross Z2 sectors don't appear. So for example, this sector here, A bar is meant to be the image in Z2 cross Z2 of A inside D4, and similarly with B bar. So to get this Z2 cross Z2 sector, I would need a pair of elements in D4 that commute with one another and project down to A bar, B bar. But if I look here at the multiplication table, A and B don't commute with one another inside D4, and there's no way I can multiply in elements of the center to change that. So I cannot build these particular sectors inside the Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. This is, again, a restriction on non-perturbative sectors. Uh, let me just briefly pause to emphasize for this crowd, I think this is redundant, but I think for the first decade I was giving talks on this. This was the most frequently asked question I got. Um, I want to emphasize that this means the D4 orbifold really is a different theory than the Z2 cross Z2 orbifold. So nowadays I can point to these and say, okay, the D4 orbifold has a one form symmetry. The Z2 cross Z2 doesn't. Since the symmetries are different, they have to be different theories. But for whatever reason, I think for the first 10 years I was giving talks on this, this is the point that so many people got hung up on. It's the Z2 doesn't do anything. How can there be a difference? Um, so, you know, just with that in mind, forgive me if I emphasize that physics knows when we gauge even a trivially acting group. All right, uh, now I can just rearrange the partition functions in the same way I did before. Uh, given any one partition function, I can multiply in elements of discrete torsion to get another partition function for another consistent theory. In this case, um, in this Z2 cross Z2 orbifold, um, discrete torsion has two possible values. Degree two group cohomology for Z2 cross Z2 is just Z2. And the non-trivial element of discrete torsion, its action is to multiply these sectors by a sign. But these are the same sectors that were omitted up here. These are the sectors that got subtracted out. So uh, as a result, I can take that D4 orbifold partition function and write it as a sum of partition functions for a pair of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds, one with discrete torsion and one without. And just in passing, let me emphasize this means that adding the universe together projects out some of the sectors. It projects out these particular sectors. So this is the interference effect I was alluding to earlier. And finally, this matches the overall prediction of decomposition. We see that the D4 orbifold, at least that the partition function of the D4 orbifold matches that of a pair of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds, which is consistent with this claim. And just for completeness, you know, here I've just described partition functions on two tori. You can do the same thing at higher genus. The combinatorics is gross, so I'm not gonna try to do it in a talk, but you can read about it. Um, let me also select out the massless states and say a few words about them because I think there's some interesting bit of physics there, although it's implicit in everything I've said so far. Let's consider a D4 orbital fold of a six torus. We can compute the massless spectrum explicitly. I've arranged the states in a Hodge diamond because I grew up doing string compactifications. And that would be fine and dandy, except if you look at it, there's a potential problem with this, um, which is the twos in the corner. And back in the day, those twos would have been viewed as a fatal problem for that computation. Um, ordinarily, if I gave this to a grad student, that gave this question to a grad student, and they came back with this answer, I'd basically pat them on the head and say, that's nice, go back and try it again, you made a mistake somewhere. Um, however, decomposition saves the day. Um, the issue is that these twos um, tell you that the theory has multiple identity operators. Um, However, there are 
in, in the language of field theory, they signal a violation of cluster decomposition, the same axiom that's violated by restricting instantons. However, in this case, if we know about decomposition and we look at the spectrum of each of the two Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds with without discrete torsion, lo and behold, the sum of the massless states for those two Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds adds up to the massless spectrum obtained here. So the result is consistent with decomposition, though again, if you looked at this without knowing about decomposition, you would quite rightly worry that there was some fundamental, you know, that some fundamental mistake had been made. Um, okay, so, so far I think I've beaten to death two-dimensional orbifolds with trivially acting centers. Um, just to give some sense of the variety of answers you can get, let me consider a two-dimensional orbifold with a trivially acting subgroup not in the center. So this is going to be an orbifold by the eight element group of unit quaternions. Let me let a Z4 generated by one of the quaternions act trivially. So there's a more general statement for the prediction of decomposition, which I'm not gonna to try to get into here. It's fun, it's interesting, it's mostly beyond the scope of this talk. What I wanna draw attention to is the statement of the decomposition. Um, in this case, orbifolding by the quaternions generates three universes, two of which are copies of a Z2 orbifold and one of which is just X itself. So in this case, we get different universes differing more than just by some choice of discrete torsion, but in some more um, um, qualitative way as well. Um, so this has fun applications. I, I don't really have the, the time to go into this, but just very briefly, uh, recently we were able to use this to give a clean understanding of some work of Wang Wen Witten. They had a proposal uh, mostly oriented towards kinetic matter theorists for uh, dealing with gauge anomalies in orbifolds. Uh, their proposal boiled down to take the anomalous subgroup, extend it to a bigger one with a trivially acting subgroup and turn on some phases. And when I looked at this, I said, well, gee, if you've got an orbifold with a, a big, a, an orbifold by a group, big group with a trivially acting subgroup, there should be a decomposition. Um, the phases they add complicate things, but the short answer is the Wang Wen Witten procedure generates copies of orbifolds in which one orbifolds by explicitly anomaly free subgroups, which is how I understand Wang Wen Witten. I just use decomposition to rewrite their result in this form, and then the fact that it fixes anomalies becomes blatantly obvious. All right. Um, let me, before going on to three dimensions, let me just briefly as an aside talk about analogous statements in gauge theories, just to make it clear that there are analogous statements that can be made in gauge theories. So let's consider a G gauge theory where some subgroup K acts trivially on all the matter. So I have K invariant matter. Um, there's a similar statement. The field theory of a G gauge theory is equivalent to a, field, to a disjoint union of G mod K gauge theories with, well, discrete theta angles in place of discrete torsions and indexed by the characters or irreducible representations of K. So same sort of form as what we've seen before. So for example, an SU2 gauge theory will decompose into a pair of SO3 theories. Well, an SU2 gauge theory with Z mod two invariant matter decomposes into a pair of SO3 theories where the plus and minus denote discrete theta angles that couple to the uh, second Stiefel Whitney class in this case. Um, in passing, let me also mention there's a similar instanton restriction effect going on here. The SU2 instantons in two dimensions are a subset of possible SO3 instantons or bundles in two dimensions. Since we're in two dimensions, whether you call them instantons or bundles is sort of a matter of um, uh, taste. Um, now the role of discrete theta angles is to weight the non-SU2 SO3 instantons differently. They multiply them by signs so that when I put these two theories together, the effect is that the non-SU2 instanton contributions cancel one another out. Summing over the SO3 theories projects out some instantons in the same fashion that we saw for orbifolds earlier. So again, a restriction on non-perturbative sectors implemented by this sum over universes. It's intrinsic to the, the decomposition story. Um, let me do one other quick fun check before going on to higher dimensions. Um, let me check this for um, uh, two-dimensional pure Yang mills, where thanks to Migdal and Rusikov, we can compute absolutely everything. Uh, let me quickly outline partition function computations here. The partition function of an SU2 theory 
is a sum over SU2 reps of an expression of this form. It's you know, some power of the dimension of the rep um, weighted by the area of the world sheet and the second Casimir of the representation. Um, the partition function for an SO3 theory with no discrete theta angle, which is what I really mean by plus, has exactly the same form, except that here we sum over the SO3 representations instead of SU2 representations. Now to put these pieces together, I need the partition function for the pure SO3 Yang-Mills theory with a non-trivial discrete theta angle. That was worked out by Yuji Tachikawa about a decade ago. It has basically the same form, except that you sum over the SU2 representations that are not SO3 representations. So if we put this together now, um, this sum falls out immediately. If I take, in each case, I'm summing the same stuff. The only difference is which irreps I sum over. If I take a sum over all SO3 reps and add to that a sum over SU2 reps that aren't SO3 reps, well, putting those together gives me a sum over all SU2 representations, which is exactly the partition function of SU2. Um, and you know, this computation works at arbitrary genus. It can be repeated in the obvious way for, for other gauge groups and for Wilson line webs and so forth. Um, just in passing, let me mention that for pure Yang-Mills, there is in fact a more extreme decomposition all the way down to invertible field theories, but I don't really have the time to do more than mention that. Okay, uh, one other thing before going on. Um, let me speak a few words about violation of cluster decomposition. I, I've sort of circled around this a few times. Let me try to deal with that head on. Um, in particular, I've given you several theories that involve uh, restricting instantons. And as Weinberg taught us all back in the 70s, that's usually a really bad idea. It violates cluster decomposition and it's a common feature in these theories. So ordinarily we would avoid it. Now the trick is a disjoint union of field theories also violates cluster decomposition, but in a trivially easy to control fashion. So the lesson I've taken from this is that restricting instantons can be okay, so long as the result can be interpreted as a disjoint union. If it's not a disjoint union, you're on your own. I have no idea what's going on, but in the special case, it's a disjoint union, um, then it's fine. Okay, so now I've talked about two-dimensional cases. In the time remaining, I want to try to briefly talk about higher dimensional cases where there's an analogous story. It's gonna follow exactly the same pattern. So here I can be considerably more brief. So let's do three dimensions next. Um, I want to build an example of a 3D theory that decomposes. Um, to do for that to happen, I need a, the three D theory to have a global two form symmetry. The way I'm going to arrange for that is by gauging a trivially acting one form symmetry, which will mean, for example, that line operators have no braiding. So let's consider an orbifold in three dimensions by a two group rather than an ordinary group. So gamma is gonna be ex an extension of an ordinary uh, finite group by a BK, a, a one form symmetry group where K is both finite and abelian. Now, since the BK is, I will assume BK acts trivially. So this theory should have a global two form symmetry and decompose. And I'm going to outline a justification for this using the same sorts of ideas as appeared earlier. So projectors, um, projectors can be constructed from monopole operators associated to that BK. The monopole operator, any given monopole operator will generate a K gerb on a two sphere surrounding the location of that, uh, surrounding its location. So for example, if K is, a, is the cyclic group of order K, then since Z mod K gerbs on a two sphere have one generator, there is one generating monopole operator, which I will call Z hat, whose Kth power is the identity. And then it's quick and easy to build projection, projection operators of this form. And you can check that these have all the same properties I've discussed earlier. Next, let me talk about, um, uh, well, partition functions in order to justify the following claimed decomposition. I claim that the gamma orbifold of X will decompose into a bunch of G orbifolds, um, as many as irreducible representations of K where the G orbifolds are now twisted by a three-dimensional analog of discrete torsion. So same pattern as in two dimensions. The details are just a shade more complicated. So let's compute partition functions. 
um, in principle, the path integral for that orbifold Mr. x mod. Yeah. Yes. Could, could you go back to this, the previous slide a second? So, sure. Um, or maybe the one with the monopoles. Um, could could there. the question is could could you say a bit more explicitly what um, what it means to have a monopole for the one form symmetry? Maybe in terms of like the uh, uh, two form connection or something. Or, right, right. So or the, it's... the curvature of the three form, the the background for the the symmetry. Right. So I think part of uh, part of what's going to be confusing here is that these are just the closest analog of these in two dimensions are twist fields for trivially acting group elements. So, which uh, may, which I suspect may be the root of the confusion. Let me let me run with that for just a second. So, it, um, in two dimensions, uh, uh, let me go back to two D and then I'll talk about three D. In two D, if I have a twist field for a trivially acting group element, um, that's that's that can be that also can be a bit difficult to wrap one's head around because ordinarily a twist field generates a branch cut which um, you know, gives fields you know, monodromies if they walk through. Um, if, the fields, if the group element is acting trivially, then the twist field, well, I mean, formally generates a branch cut, but the branch cut isn't really you know, doing anything. It's a, a completely trivially, um, it's an invisible branch cut, if you will. Mm -hmm. So in three dimensions, if I have a monopole operator for a trivially acting group element, then in principle, it's going to generate a, a K gerb on its surrounding two sphere. Uh, analogously, in two dimensions, a twist field will generate a, um, you know, a bundle on a circle surrounding the insertion of the twist field. So in three dimensions, a monopole operator will generate a gerb on a two sphere surrounding the location of the monopole operator. In this case, just as in two dimensions, the fact that the group element acts trivially you know, how should I say, the first time I tried thinking about this, I managed to get myself very confused trying to wonder what in the world is the twist field actually doing? How can it be there? And the confusions that come to mind about monopole operators in this, fact, in this setting are all of exactly the same form. If the group element isn't actually doing anything, why is it there? And back in the day, one of the papers Tony and I wrote was really devoted to explaining that in the case of um, in two-dimensional cases, you can argue that if those twist fields aren't really there, then the theory violates unitarity. So they, they have to be there in order for the, uh, that orbifold construction to actually give a well-defined theory. Am um, I allowed to say it in the following way? So, I mean, I, I'm gauging a, a one-form symmetry here, right? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, and I can think of a background for that as a, as a, a two-form, a class in H2. Sure. Um, and I'm kind of defining a defect by demanding that the evaluation of that class on the two sphere surrounding a point is some fixed value. Is some sounds fixed. good. Is sounds that, good. Is that another way to think about? That's right. And the gerb is then, uh, maybe, maybe that's the point. I, I've been using the language of gerbs too many years. And I, I, that, that's, I think if I'm, if I'm understanding what you're saying, that's exactly, I, I think I completely agree. And that's what I uh, was in, that's what I meant to communicate. With a statement about gerbs on surrounding two spheres, um, exactly, exactly that. All right. So, why is the twist sector field here topological? Oh, uh, because it act because the really because the corresponding line operators are trivially acting. Um, in a sense, I have not taken the time to really say much about beyond the statement of trivial braiding. So, what I uh, in a little more detail, I mean that the. Um, if one writes down line operators for the BK, that they have trivial braiding with everything and that their fusion products leave everything invariant. Um, so that's, that's ultimately the best answer. Thank you. All right, let me uh, go on then. Right, so this is the claim for decomposition. Let me see if I can quickly outline a justification for this. So the path integral for this orbifold has sort of morally two pieces. There'll be principal two group bundles over a three manifold. And then for each of those bundles, I'll have a map from that bundle into the target space, just like an ordinary orbifold. Now, since the BK acts trivially, the twisted sectors, the analogs of twisted sectors should be those of a G orbifold. However, those G, those G twisted sectors are restricted. And there's a fun story behind why this is the case, but the answer turns out to look like this. If I have a, uh, in this gamma orbifold, if I think of the 
um, the, the gamma bundles as being G bundles with a restriction. I can, or I, because of BKX trivially, I can think of these gamma bundles as basically being G bundles, but with a restriction. The restriction has this form. So in two dimensions on a, or at least on a three torus, the restriction has this form. So in two dimensions, the restriction we saw was that um, omega G1, G2 has to be equal to omega G2, G1, that move, the order of the omegas doesn't matter. Here on a three torus, one gets an analogous statement um, that the, um, uh, you know, this totally anti-symmetric combination of, this totally anti-symmetric product of three, three co-cycles should be equal to one as an element of K. So uh, if anyone's curious, you know, later I can give you a couple of ways of thinking about this. Um, but for the moment, uh, just for sake of time, let me just take this as a given. Just as in two dimensions, we can think about gamma bundles as special G bundles. Um, here, the condition we needed for a G bundle to arise from a gamma bundle has this form. As before, we can implement this restriction by inserting a delta function into the partition function. And then when we do so, the partition function on a three torus ends up having this sort of form. So there are some numerical factors. There's a sum over, uh, well, k-gerbs in principle. There's a sum over commuting triples of group elements since we're on a three torus. Um, and then we've got this delta function. And then when I expand out that delta function that it forces the constraint, and then take into account that the k is acting trivially, so it's just generating some overall numerical factor, the result can be written in this form as a sum of partition functions for g orbifolds, um, as many copies of g orbifolds as irreducible representations of k, where each of the g orbifolds now is twisted by an L, an L, a three field, a three form analog of discrete torsion, which is basically given by composing this quantity with rho. So um, there, there. So that uh, formally is the argument for partition functions. Um, and in particular, adding the universes together projects out some of the sectors. So it's the same exact sort of argument as the one I gave earlier in two dimensions. Now, in fairness, there are various different arguments one can give in two dimensions, but I picked an argument in two dimensions, which I knew would generalize naturally to the three-dimensional case. Okay, so it's the same sort of idea. Adding the, um, the uh, there's a restriction on non-perturbative sectors. The one role of the decomposition is to project out the sectors which don't satisfy that condition. Adding the universes project together projects out the undesired sectors. Um, and there are similar results on other three manifolds, but for lack of time, uh, not certain it's worth going in. You can read about them in the paper. Um, so finally, let me very briefly walk through churn simons and then maybe if people are still interested at the end, I can talk about condensation defects. So in churn simons um, there is an, a similar story. Um, let's consider a churn simons theory for some Lie group H at some level, quotiented by BA, where A is some finite abelian group. Now there are all sorts of footnotes I should add at this point. Churn simons theory a random churn simons theory at a random level may, may not make sense on a, on a random three manifold. Um, I'm going to assume that I'm working on a three manifold for which the churn simons theory um, at that level makes sense, uh, just to avoid having to spend three or four slides restrict describing families of uh, special cases that have to be taken into account. Um, suffice to say, um, here's the claimed decomposition if A has a subgroup that acts trivially. Chern Simon's theory for group H, modulo of BA, will be a disjoint union of Chern Simon's theories for a group for G, where G is what I get when I take H and I quotient out the effectively acting part of A. And then these omegas here are going to be um, discrete theta angles. I'm strictly speaking, the omegas there are um, images under the Bockstein homomorphism of the um, um, uh, canonical degree two characteristic class in G. So these will be Bockstein, these will be discrete theta angles coupling to Bockstein images, well, of uh, degree two characteristic classes. And the Bockstein map is what bumps it up to a degree three uh, cohomology class. 
So um, this is the form of the statement. It can be justified in much the same fashion as before. Um, let me just give a couple of quick examples. Uh, let's do something, a standard result in the literature and view it as a special case of this. Let's take an SU2 churn simons theory and quotient out by the BZ2 corresponding to the center. So here, there's no trivially acting part. The Z2 corresponding to the center does not act trivially. So uh, there's no trivially acting piece. Um, what we're going to get from this diction, so K in other words is one. We only get one piece in this decomposition um, and it's just churn simons theory for SO3. And this relationship is a standard one you can find in the literature dating back to, oh geez, I, I think probably more in Cyberg in 86 or 87 were the first ones to, to write this down, but there may have even been papers before that. Um, now let me generalize that a little bit. If I, instead of quotient by a BZ2, if I quotient by a BZ4, where a Z2 subgroup of Z4 acts trivially, um, then um, the Z2 coset of Z4 acts on the SU2, its quotient will be an SO3. In this case, the quotient of SU2 churn simons by a BZ4 will be two copies of churn simons for SO3. Two copies because the trivially acting subgroup in this case is just a Z mod 2, and Z mod 2 has two irreps. So since Z mod 2 has two irreps, I get two churn simons theories. And as before, the discrete data angles they couple to are images under the box stein of uh, a pertinent degree two characteristic class. In this case, the degree two characteristic class in question is the second Stiefel Whitney class, but its image under the box stein for the map Z2 to Z4 to Z2 is exactly the third Stiefel Whitney class. So churn simons for SU2 mod BZ4 seems to be the same as, <coughs> excuse me, a pair of churn simons theories for SO3 weighted by discrete theta angles coupling to the third Stiefel Whitney class. And then the, the weighting is, um, you know, the discrete theta angle involves a pairing between um, um, a K value characteristic class and, ir and an irrep of K. So that's, that's what's meant by that omega row there. Um, Ah, boundaries. Um, one of the fun things that came out of this work was a, sort of a nice check of all of this. So one of the games people have played many, many times over the years with churn simons theories is to look on, is to work on a three manifold with boundary. And as has been discussed many, many times in the literature by now, a churn simons theory in the bulk is naturally associated with the WZW model on the boundary. Furthermore, in these sorts of gaugings, the way the dictionary works is that gauging by a BA in the bulk becomes an orbifold by A on the boundary, which I think also basically goes back to Moore and Cyberg, though I, um, uh, or, or thereabouts. In particular, one can show that um, if one look, take, works on a three manifold with boundary, this bulk decomposition becomes a decomposition of this form on the boundary. So an orbifold by a WZW model for H is related to a sum of WZW models for G. And one of the things that really struck me or struck my fancy was that in the bulk theory, the discrete theta angles couple to bundle characteristic classes. So for the SU2, SU3, SO3 example we just saw, these omegas couple to the um, third Stiefel, uh, to the uh, to third Stiefel Whitney class. On the boundary, after you do some diagram chasing, you find that those bundle characteristic classes turn into choices of discrete torsion. So, uh, which is a relation that I might, I would not have necessarily guessed at first. So in particular, on the boundary, uh, this bulk story becomes on the boundary, a relationship between an A orbifold of one WZW model and a disjoint union of other WZW models weighted by discrete torsions and in particular, this is just another example of the same decomposition that I talked about earlier. So the three-dimensional decomposition on a manifold with boundary reduces to a two-dimensional orbifold decomposition of exactly the same form I spent um, much of the talk so far outlining. Ugh. Okay. Um, Right, so there's one last thing I'm hoping to run by this audience on condensation defects.
It'll take maybe another five minutes, but I'm already about three or four minutes over. So let me ask. It's okay. Me. Okay, it's fine. All right. Thank you very much. This will be fun. So this is still this last bit on condensation defects is still in progress, but it's um, it's fun. I think I've got enough for a short paper, and I'm seriously and since conference season is starting, I'm seriously thinking about putting out within the next week or two. So condensation defects. Here's what I understand about condensation defects. Um, let me work in a three dimensional. Uh, uh, let me work in three dimensions. Suppose I have a theory with a global one-form symmetry. Now in 3D, there's no decomposition I get from that. I need a two-form symmetry if I want the theory to decompose. However, the restriction to a two-submanifold would decompose because if I can generate a two-dimensional theory with a one-form symmetry, then decomposition comes into play. Now to get a condensation defect, what I do, or one way to get a condensation defect is to start in three dimensions, um, pick some two-dimensional submanifold, and then gauge the one-form symmetry along that two-dimensional submanifold. This produces a condensation defect, but at the same time, this also selects out a universe from the decomposition of the restriction. Which universe you get depends upon a, a theta angle. To uniquely specify the gauging of a one-form symmetry, I need to specify a theta angle. Different choices of theta angles will select out different universes, but you know, that's, the, that's the game we can play. So in particular, this allows us to apply decomposition to understand, well, not all condensation defects, but at least some condensation defects. Con condensation defects with the property that, the, um, that they live on a d-dimensional space and that the higher symmetry being gauged looks like a d minus one form symmetry along that particular space. So let me quickly outline some examples. Um, actually, before I do the examples, let me just very quickly outline uh, a few details in orbifolds. So let's consider a 3D orbifold um, where some or where this is an ordinary group, not a two group. And let's assume that some subgroup acts trivially. So the theory has a BK symmetry. If we restrict the theory to a two-dimensional submanifold, then formally at least that restriction has a decomposition. And let's label the defects we would get from gauging that one form symmetry by SI sigma, where I indexes possible values of theta angles. So what does it actually mean? Well, here's the partition function. If I gauge a one form symmetry in, in a two dimensional orbifold, the partition function has this form. So buried in the middle here, what you can see, you can see what looks like the partition function for an ordinary orbifold, except that the twisted sectors are now twisted by the gerb. G and H don't quite have to commute one, one another anymore. They only have to commute up to uh, an element of the, well, really the gerb characteristic class. And then outside of that, the path integral sums over gerbs. And this epsilon I is that um, theta angle I mentioned. Then in principle, we can compute a fusion rule. Um, to do that, I need to join the, those defects by a sort of three-dimensional Wilson membrane, just as if I were trying to compute an OPE between charged operators in ordinary field theory. Um, so the computation one does ends up looking something like this. In principle, you might have different gerbs on either of the two defects. Um, uh, you need to take into account overlaps and field redefinitions. So that pulls out an overall factor of, um, well, if the gerbs are each cyclic of order P and K respectively, then there'll be a gerbs worth of uh, a cyclic group given by the GCDs worth of redundant uh, information. Um, the surviving gerb is given by the least common multiple of P and K. Um, then you do this orbifold partition function on each end, and you also do a path integral over, well, you're doing a path integral over that whole bulk three dimensional theory, but since this is lying on a box and the box can be shrunk down to just um, you know, one copy of sigma, really the, the contribution of the bulk is to generate isomorphism classes or uh, parallel transporters relating the bundle on one side to a bundle on the other side. So here are some quick examples. If I have a three-dimensional Z2 dicraft witten theory, so this is a three-dimensional orbifold of a point by Z2. This has a one-form symmetry, so no decomposition in three dimensions, but the restriction to a two-submanifold decomposes to two identical universes. I can then gauge a BZ2 along sigma. And if I turn on a theta angle, that will select out either of the universes. In this case, the two universes are isomorphic. So I can basically drop the extra index and treat them as the same. 
And then you can compute the fusion rule and show that the fusion product of those two condensation defects is, well, twice the fusion product as before. And this is some, that factor of two is sometimes described in terms of a two-dimensional unitary TFT. But for reasons just discuss, or discussed earlier, a two-dimensional unitary TFT with a semi-similar local operator algebra is equivalent to a disjoint union. So rather than talk about coupling and topological field theories, I'm just going to say it's an integer. Um, that, that won't always hold in this story, but at least in these simple cases, these particular fusion products could be described either by a coupling to a TFT or just by an integer. And I think an integer for me is the more uh, thing that's easier to understand. Um, two more quick examples. Let's consider a 3D orbital followed by the dihedral group, where a Z2 acts trivially. Um, as before, there's no 3D decomposition, but if we restrict to a two-dimensional submanifold of space-time, formally you get a decomposition into a pair of Z2 cross Z2 orbifolds with or without discrete torsion. If you gauge the BZ2 along that two-dimensional slice, you can get a pair of different condensation defects depending upon which discrete theta angle you, or depending upon which theta angle for that one form symmetry that you turn on. And then applying the same rules as before, you can compute the fusion products. Here, the combinatorics of the fusion product is more exciting. Um, it takes about a couple of pages in my notes just to list all the different games you can play, but the result sort of has the same form as before. The product of any of two condensation defects is twice a condensation defect again. The structure is a little bit more intricate, but in broad brushstrokes, it looks pretty much the same as the Z2 digraph witten theory case. In each case, the fusion product of two defects is twice a defect. Uh, the difference is now that the defects are different, and so you know, one needs to keep track of which defects are actually appearing. And then finally, um, for an H orbifold, if I consider a 3D orbifold by the quaternions, um, Again, there's no decomposition in three dimensions, but if I restrict to a two submanifold, then I get these three universes. Here I can gauge a BZ2. I have to be a little bit careful. A Z4 acts trivially, but part of that Z4 is acting in a non-invertible fashion. So for reasons of my personal sanity, I only consider gauging a BZ2 center for which everything is simple and invertible. The two condensation defects have this form, a pair of Z2 orbifolds. folds, or just one copy of some low energy effective sigma model on X. And as before, one can compute fusion products. As before, the combinatorics is really rather non-trivial. Um, you have to keep track of uh, all the isomorphisms and taking them into account is necessary in order to get the combinatorics to work out correctly. But when you do, the result has a, a simple form, uh, pretty much the same, in broad brushstrokes, it's the same form as in a Z2 digraph witten theory. Um, as before, one just needs to keep track of which defects it is that are appearing. Um, so there's a, the structure is a bit more intricate than just for our Z2 digraph witten but in broad brushstrokes, it certainly has the same form. Okay, and with that, I'm now uh, 12 minutes over time. So I am going to stop and thank you all very much for patiently uh, listening to my introduction to decomposition. So thanks again. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Um, questions? I have a question. Um, Go for it. So uh, is there a notion of anomaly resolution for one form symmetry in 3D, which can be explained using this 3D um, decomposition? So Wang, Wen, and Witten actually do have such a notion. I don't understand how to uh, understand it with decomposition. Um, it's uh, yeah, uh, formally, Wang, Wen, and Witten do have such an idea. I haven't figured out how to, uh, how to understand it with decomposition. It's one of the things that's been on my desk um, it's one of the things that's on my desk. If you're curious about it, if you have some ideas, you know, send me an email. Let's get in touch. Um, I, haven't, I haven't quite seen how to make it work, but I've also had too many other things to do. Uh, so at some point, it sort of you know, floated off the top of my uh, to-do pile. But um, you know, if you're interested in it, let's definitely talk. Thank you.
Okay, more questions. I've already had a few questions, so if... Yeah. Well, we could stop, stop the recording and then uh, if, if, if anyone would like to ask some more questions, if, if, you're, if you're free to stay for a bit. Sure, uh, sure, I can stick around for a while.